Ah. Hello, dear friends, and welcome to part 13 of this whispered read-through of a truly wonderful book, The 70 Great Mysteries of the Ancient World, Unlocking the Secrets of Past Civilizations. The penultimate episode now, as we are up to number 16, we continue our exploration of ancient languages and writing. So at number 60 we have the Etrusian alphabet, sometime between the 8th to the 1st century BC in Italy. And Massimo Palottino of 1975 says, even today, 90% of the educated public firmly believes that Etrusian is totally indecipherable. This belief is echoed in the press and repeated in the majority of textbooks, even though it is over 200 years out of date. Interesting. So the Etrusians and their homeland, Etruria, which is modern Tuscany, a wonderful part of the world, of course, have exerted a special hold on the imagination of Europeans ever since Roman times. During the Renaissance, Cosimo de Medici, Grand Duke of Tuscany, was poetically cast as the Etrusian king Lars Porsena after the supposed discovery of the ancient ruler's tomb at Chiusi, and in the 20th century, D. H. Lawrence imbued much of his final poetry with imagery taken from his descents into Etrusian tombs. Here's a quote. Reach me, Agendian, give me a torch. Let me guide myself with the blue forked torch of this flower down the darker and darker stairs, even where Persephone goes. So in the history of language, the Etrusians are undoubtedly of great interest and importance, so they adopted the alphabet from the Greeks. They modified, passed it to the Romans, and then it reached the rest of Europe. But their spoken language became extinct, and as far as we can tell from reconstructions of it based on their inscriptions, it doesn't really have any resemblance to any European language. So simply comparing Etrusian words for numerals within their equivalents in Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit, we can see that Etrusian was not an Indo-European language. Here is a Etrusian vase or ink well in the shape of a rooster around uh, circa 600 BC. It's incised with the letters of a model alphabet borrowed from the Greek alphabet. You can see A, B, C, D, E there. And we have the um, differences between the languages here. So English, Etrusian, Latin, Greek, Sanskrit. One is thu in Etrusian. Oinos or unos in Latin. Oin in Greek. And eka in Sanskrit. Two, zal, duo, dio, dva. Three, si, tres. Tres, traia, four, sa, quattro, tetares, catvar, five, mark, quinque, cinque, pente, panca, six, hus, sex, hex, sat, ten, sa, desem, deca, daza. So I think in any of these languages, apart from Adrusian, you could figure out what someone was saying, even if you didn't know their language, couldn't you? Onus, duo, tres, cuatro, cinco, sex, decim, o, on, deo, tres, tetares, pente, hex, deca, pete, he, thu, sal, si, sa, mag, ruth, sa. You would have trouble deciphering what that actually was. So the Etrusians learnt the alphabet from Greek colonists who settled in Italy at about 775 BC at uh, Pithecusae, which is modern Asia. And they wrote the letters in the form of model alphabets. And they've uh, enjoyed prestige because they've been found on many objects at many sites. And in practice, not all of the letters were used since the Etrusian language had no need of signs for the voiced stops like B, D, G, and the vowel O. So they didn't use the Greek signs that um, are, 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 are similar to those they gave the Greek gamma, the phonetic value K instead of G. So 
this means that three attrition signs were used to write K as an English think. Um, K before A, uh, before this symbol before E, and I, and this symbol before U. So although there are about 13,000 known attrition inscriptions, of which here are a couple of gold plaques from Pierre the plaque on the left is written in Phoenician, and the one on the right is in Etrusian or um, Etrusian or Greek. Some four thousand of these fragments, or graffiti, and the vast majority of the other nine thousand inscriptions are short, mainly epitaphs containing only names like the father's name, sometimes the mother's, the surname of the deceased, and if she was a woman, perhaps the name of her husband and number of children, maybe an age and a public office held, formulaic phrases. So it's not much problem in reading these simply by substituting the phonetic values of the letters, or has been understood since the 18th century or before, but it's rather like trying to learn a language by reading only gravestones. So what's lacking is a substantial bilingual text containing other subject matter. In 1964, these three gold tablets were discovered at Piri, the harbour of Kier, now Kervateri. They're the most important bilingual inscriptions in the Etrusian corpus. One of the plaques in Phoenician, the other two, Etrusian, and uh, the longer one contains 36 or 37 words. But the Phoenician and Etrusian inscriptions are not word for word translations. It must be so frustrating working as an archaeologist or a language historian to piece together this evidence, mustn't it? The Pierre tablets are more of a quasi-bilingual inscription than a true one because both record the same event, the dedication by the ruler of the Fari Thelianus in the third year of his reign of a cult place and perhaps a statue to the Venetian goddess Testate or Ishtar, which is identified here with the Etrusian goddess Uni. But they do so in really different ways in the end. C, meaning three, was the only new Etrusian word to emerge from the Pierre plaques. And the same proved to be true of the latest inscription to be discovered. In the 90s, the tabula cordonensis containing 200 words, which are mostly names, the only new word appears to be that for lake. So the script is no, therefore no mystery. The language, though, certainly is, so despite many other raised decipherments such as Etrusian art and Latin inscriptions, our total vocabulary for Etrusian is still only about 250 words. Not a lot of it of secure meaning, and our knowledge of the grammar is extremely patchy because of the limited nature of the uh, inscriptions. We have limited knowledge of their syntax because no literature has survived, so it's like trying to understand the language of an entire culture based on the level of a two-year-old. Here we have the Meroitic script, number 61, the 3rd century to 4th century AD in Sudan. Here's Francis Llewellyn Griffith in 1909. To learn that nomads from the eastern desert once founded an empire in the valley of the Nile at Moreau would perhaps not be more surprising than the fact that a nation which pioneered the world in material and intellectual uh, culture were the ancestors of the Egyptian phalaini. So if you look at the map of the course of the Nile, you'll see that the river flows in two great bends through six cataracts from Khartoum near the centre of Sudan to Lake Nasser and Aswan on the modern border between Sudan and Egypt. This vast area rivaling that of ancient Egypt is known to archaeologists as Nubia, and in ancient times it was the kingdom of Kush, a word of unknown origin, and its principal city was Moro, between the fifth and sixth cataracts on the Nile. So the Moraitic civilization, one of the most important early states of sub-Saharan Africa, not a mere appendage of ancient Egypt. Its archaeological origins go back to the 3rd millennium BC, but it enters history through references to it in Egyptian hieroglyphic inscriptions. Here are um, Moraitic hieroglyphs and cursive letters and their phonetic values. 
the forms resemble Egyptian hieroglyphs, but uh, the system's alphabetic. So it's A B, sorry A E I O Y W B P M N N A R I B H S C K Q T T T O D and a word divider. So Kushite kings conquered and ruled Egypt and were accepted as its 25th dynasty, governing an empire that extended from the central Sudan to the borders of Palestine. The Egyptian hieroglyphs were used in Kush until as late as the 1st century AD, but they increasingly coexisted with the Meroitic script, which was both hieroglyphic and cursive in form like Egyptian script. So brief bilingual inscriptions found at Moreau and elsewhere have allowed scholars, chiefly Francis Noel and Griffith, who are quote comes from here, to decipher the phonetic values of the Moroitic script. There are only 23 hieroglyphic signs, and the same number of cursive ones, most of which were borrowed from the Egyptian script. So in other words, the Moroitic hieroglyphs visually resemble Egyptian hieroglyphs, but they're actually an alphabet. So we can therefore translate many Moroitic names and can also guess the meanings of a handful of Moroitic words that are not names by comparing them with the parallel Egyptian words. But the Moroitic language as a whole is a virtual mystery. The words we have, have seem to bear no relation to the old Nubian language or to any other African language in the area from either the Nilo-Saharan or Afro-Asiatic families. Thus there's no simple linguistic solution, no sub-Saharan equivalent of Coptic, the key to the decipherment of Egyptian hieroglyphs. The best immediate hope for advancing the decipherment would uh, appear to be the, dis the discovery of a larger bilingual text, probably in Meroitic and Egyptian. Perhaps we shall eventually learn, as Griffith has hazarded, that the people who created the kingdom of Kush spoke an early form of Beja, the language of today's nomads of the eastern desert near the Red Sea, whose name has given us the English Bedouin. Of course, the Bedouin people are, um, in terms of popular culture, um, Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia allied himself to the Bedouin population to fight against um, the occupation there in the in the Great War, the Second World War, one should say. I think it was the Second World War. Yes, the Zapotec and Isthmian scripts, 500 BC to Second Century AD in Mexico. Martha J. Macri in 1993 says the La Mohra is the oldest example of an extended written text and perhaps the most important inscription ever discovered in Mesoamerica. A big setup there. And of the several pre Mayan scripts in Central America, the Zapotec script and the Ithmaean script, both of which are undeciphered, are the most significant, so the, the former. The Zapotec is the earliest known writing system in the Americas, dating from perhaps 500 BC, while the latter has a somewhat later date, the 2nd century AD. Geographically, the Zapotec script was a close neighbour of the Ismaean, which was itself contiguous with the area of the Mayan script, first recorded in the 3rd century AD. So it's quite likely, therefore, that the Zapotec script influenced the Ismaean script, which in turn influenced the Mayan. So the majority of Zapotec inscriptions, and the most significant ones, come from the Zapotec capital city, built on the tremendous hilltop site of Monte Oban, outside the modern city of Oaxaca. The glyphs do not resemble Mixtec, Aztec or Mayan writing visually, except for the fact they use the same bar and dot numerals in a very similar calendrical system. They are presumably invented by the Zapotec, so luckily for decipherers, a Spanish priest published a Spanish Zapotec dictionary in 1578 that included the names of the 20 days in the Zapotec language at the time. It doesn't match each name to a Zapotec glyph, since the writing system had been extinct for centuries. Here's the uh, Zapotec day names and signs. So, um, well, these glyphs are quite complex, aren't they? Chila, which is legato in Spanish, or crocodile. 
like a really ornate mask. La, Relampanco is lightning. La, la, we don't know what that is, but that's the glyph. La, chi, juega de pelote, it could be ball game. Si, miseria or misfortune. Lana is flecha or Disney, arrow or suit. That's like a, a it's like a skull wearing a pair of sunglasses that looks like something you get on a, on a craft beer can. China, Venado, dear. Lapa, we don't know what that is. The cliff almost looks like a salamander or a turtle or something. Nika, aqua, uh, water. Tea is nudo or not. Lu, mono or mono, which is monkey. Pia, we plant a habanero, a soap plant. We don't know what la is. It looks like a satchel and a, a hut of some sort. Lache, corazon, heart. I love the Spanish word for heart. Corazon, corazon. Na milpa, cornfield. Lu, ojo, I. Ju, temblor or earthquake. Lopa, we don't know what that means. And the cliffs are quite undecipherable. La Pe got a drop. And Lu, principal ruler or lord. Amazing that just the, the, the ability to decipher all of this just seems like intellectual magic. Here's a drawing of the La Mojara Stella. The inscriptions contain 400 to 500 text characters, including dates. Wonderful um, illustrative quality there. So the decipherment of the non calendrical glyphs has proved to be much trickier. It depends on the identifying language of the glyphs. So it might be related to the modern Zapotec language, but the link is likely to be a tangled one. Not only is there the issue of language change over some 2,000 years to consider, the Zapotecan language group itself is highly diversified, has three major branches, branches and several mutually unintelligible dialects. And we only really know the names of only a very few ancient locations which might be expected to appear in the inscriptions in Zapotec because many locations in Oaxaca have long been known by their names in Nahuatl, the language of the Aztecs, which intruded into the area well before the Spanish con uh, conquest. So nevertheless, scholars have established that there were at least 100 basic Zapotec signs in the writing system, too high a figure for the script to be purely symbolic, too low for it to be logosymbolic like the Mayan script. So the same is true of the Isthmian script, but curiously, given that there is much less of it available, we understand it better than the Zapotec script, because first, most of the Isthmian script is concentrated in one long dated inscription accompanied by the figure of a ruler and second the linguistic situation is somewhat clearer in the isthmus of Tukanopec than in the Oaxaca state so the Isthmian story dates from 1902 when a strange little statuette made of jade was ploughed up in a field uh, apparently in the Tuzla mountains near San Andres Tuzla in uh, southern Veracruz it depicted a man dressed as a duck it ends inscribed with about 70 characters of unknown writing deposited in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington DC it acquired a kind of cult status over the decades like the Feistos disc came out a few years later because no examples, other examples of the script turned up then in 1986 barefooted fishermen at La Morara, a small ranching and fishing settlement on a river near the Gulf Coast, not far from Tushla, stumbled upon a four-ton engraved stone underwater. The La Morara Stella contains 400 to 500 text characters and is clearly written in the same script as the Tushla statuette. So there's a general agreement that the most likely candidate from the Isthmian language is an early form of Zoquin, a branch of the mixes of Queen language family spoken in the Isthmus and adjacent areas today. Indeed, some scholars believe that the Olmecs who created the earliest civilization in Mesoamerica, although one without writing, that flourished in the same area as La Mojara, were mixes of Queen speakers. They therefore call Isthmian controversially an epi- Olmec script. The mixes of Guian hypothesis is, however, speculative, not unlike the Dravidian hypothesis for the Indus script, 
when applied to the Isthmian inscriptions by attempting to match apparent patterns and imagery in the signs with known words, grammar, and syntax in the reconstructed Zoguian language produces a possible decipherment. The difficulty is there's no way of knowing if the proposed solution is correct because there are no further Isthmian inscriptions against which the decipherment can be tested. Despite strong claims to the contrary, the Isthmian script therefore remains undeciphered. I just love the idea of um, a group of fishermen uncovering a five-ton inscribed stone in water going about their day. Just so exciting that undiscovered wondery, wonderment can, uh, can be around our planet. We have runes and Pictish symbol stones here in uh, the 2nd and 9th centuries AD in Northern Europe and Greenland. The first law of runodynamics states for every runic inscription there shall be as many interpretations as there are scholars working on it. In case of too many uh, chefs boiling the broth, I suppose, here's the Rockstone in Östergötland of Sweden, the longest known runic inscription that's massive. It was written by Farin in memory of Vaynod, his dead son in the early Viking Age. So the vast majority of European scripts derive from the Roman letters, which has tended to obscure the existence of one significant European script, runic, whose links with the Roman script are less certain. So from as far back as the 2nd century AD, runes have been found that were used to record the early stages of Gothic, Danish, Swedish, Norwegian, English, Frisian, Frank Frankish, and various tribal tongues of central Germania. So the range of runic scripts reflects the range of languages involved. The total number of known runic inscriptions is probably in the region of 5,000, almost all of which are located in Nordic countries, and the great majority are in Sweden, where discoveries of rune stones are still frequently made. Norway has over 1,000 inscriptions, and Denmark some 700. Iceland has about 60, all for comparatively late times, and there are also runic texts from Greenland and the Faroes. So some of these are those in the British Isles found in the Isle of Man, the Orkney Islands, the Shetland Islands, Ireland and the Western Isles are the work of travelling Norsemen. So we do not know where and when runes were invented. Finds of early rune inscribed objects in Romania, Central Germany and Russia indicate that runes may have been invented in that general area, perhaps by Goths on the Danube frontier or beside the Vistula. Another hypothesis notes the resemblance between the runes and characters used in inscriptions of the Alpine valleys of southern Switzerland and northern Italy and goes on to ascribe the invention of uh, to Romanized Germany from that uh, area. There may even be a link with the Etrusian alphabet. And a third hypothesis prefers one of the Germanic tribes of Denmark, perhaps south, uh, uh, southern Jutland, as the progenitors of runes. Many of the earliest inscriptions come from this general area, and early runic texts continue to be found in various regions of Denmark. But on one point all scholars of runes agree, the Roman alphabet ex exercised influence of some kind on the runic script. So the Rudic alphabet has 24 letters arranged in a peculiar order known as the Fudarg after its first six letters. Uh, F U Th A R K G W H N I J I P Z S T B E M L N O D. There's the uh, Hunterston Bridge found at Strathclyde in Scotland. The runes in the left of the pin give the owner's name. Melbrigda, and those to the right are uh, pretend runes. Here it is written from left to right, but it could be written from right to left equally well in early times. Or even uh, Bostrovaden, which is from right to left and from left to right in alternate lines. That's a word I've never heard of before that I've learned today. Boostrafeden, which means to read from right to left and left to right in alternate lines. Boostrafeden. An individual letter could also be reversed on occasions. Apparently at whim, it might even be inverted. No distinction was made between capital and lowercase letters. Some of the letters 
letters are obviously related to letters of the Roman alphabet, such as the runes standing for R, I, and P. Others could but well be the adaptation of Roman letters, such as those for F and U, which is Roman V inverted, K, which is the Roman C, H, S, T, and L, which are the Roman L inverted, but other letters, such as those representing G, W, J, and P, scarcely resemble Roman forms with the same sound value. So the sound values given above are approximate the sounds of early Germanic languages and not exactly paralleled in modern English. There is a rune, for example, for the spirit sound of th, as in thin. It was used in early English spelling and called thorn. There is a vowel represented here as I, and the pronunciation of which is disputed. Runic script could also uh, distinguish between the ng in ungrateful and ng as in sing. But even though runic inscriptions can usually be read in the same sense as Etruscan inscriptions, their meaning is frequently cryptic because of our lack of knowledge of the early Germanic languages. Hence the origin of today's expression, to read the runes, meaning to make an educated guess on the basis of scanty and ambiguous evidence. The Pictish symbol stones are, if anything, even more tantalizing. They, they number about 630, including those recorded as lost, and they're found only in Scotland, which was ruled by the Picts between the 4th and 9th centuries AD. There are about 425 legible symbols, which can be grouped into some 50 different signs, the most common of which are the crescent and V-rod, the double disc, um, and sea rod, the dolphin, the fish, and the mirror and comb. There's clearly no resemblance to the Roman alphabet, and indeed, Pictish symbols usually occur in pairs, only rarely in groups of more than four, so they're very unlikely to be alphabetic. Here is a uh, silver and enamel plaques from the Norris Law Hoard, probably 5th century AD, and the symbols are a double disc and sea rod, a seal's head. Here are the most common Pictish symbols. And this is uh, Golsby number two from Scotland, a class two symbol stone showing, among other things, a Pictish beast, picked man with double headed axe and dirk facing a lion and fish, and two twined adders biting their own fish tails. So two major classes exist. Class 1 consists only of symbols uh, incised on undressed boulders and Neolithic and Bronze Age monoliths. Class 2, with obviously Christian symbolism, consists of a cross and often striking decoration carved on one side of a slab of local stone. And the same symbols as in Class 1, also with decoration, sometimes a second cross carved on the back. So since the Pictish language, a form of Gaelic, is lost to us, an interpretation of the inscriptions rests entirely on the symbols themselves. Most likely the Pictish symbols represent chiefly personal names in the manner of later heraldic devices or commemorate important events, some are almost certainly gravestones. And unlike the runic script, the Pictic symbols were not a full writing system. Interesting reading the runes. I didn't realize so many were undeciphered. Here we have Rongo Rongo, sometime in the 19th century AD in Easter Island. Otomatua, a legendary first settler of Easter Island, said, Our co how Rongo Rongo are lost. The future events will destroy these sacred tablets which we bring with us and those which we will make in our new land. Men of other races will guard a few that remain as priceless objects, and their Maori will study them in vain without being able to read them. Our ko ao motu morongo rongo will be lost forever. Ai ai. So Easter Island or Rapa Nui, as it's known to its inhabitants, is the most isolated inhabited spot on Earth. Its nearest inhabited neighbour, some 1,400 miles east southeast, is Pitcairn Island, which is. It is also small, as islands go, a maximum length of 15 miles. One of its many mysteries, which include its unique and imposing stone statues, as we covered in a previous episode, is the fact that the island possesses its own script, known as Rongo Rongo, a word meaning chants or recitations. So exotic and enigmatic is it that Rongo Rongo has proved to be a permanent magnet for would-be decipherers ever since it was discovered by Europeans in the 1860s. There are 25 Rongo Rongo inscriptions carved on wood, probably with a shark's tooth, bird bone or flake of obsidian, scattered from Honolulu and Santiago to European 
capitals. Not a single one remains on Easter Island itself, and most are named after their uh, current locations, such as the uh, large St. Petersburg uh, tablet. But a few have names in the Rapa Nui language, such as Mamari, which is egg, from the object's egg-like shape, or in one case, a French name, in Shan Cri, notched, again because of the tablet's appearance. So many of the inscriptions are very short, but the largest and longest, the Santiago Staff, has some 2,300 characters on a wooden staff that measures 50 by 2.5 inches, and a second inscription, Taua, a wooden tablet made out of a European or an, uh, an American ore, contains about 1,825 characters. It's the longest tablet inscription. So hardly anyone doubts that the Ronga Ronga inscriptions are written in a Polynesian language related to today's Rapa Nui language. The problem is to determine how the language changed since the time when the inscriptions were written, and of course to relate it to the inscriptions. But no one can be sure how old the Ronga Ronga is as a system of writing. None of the inscriptions are dated. Was Ronga Ronga brought to the island from Polynesia perhaps a millennium and a half ago? Or was it invented on the island unaided by outside influences? Was it the product of contacts with the first European visitors in the 18th century? There is some evidence for all three possibilities. If independent intervention on the island were to be proved, it would constitute exceptionally strong evidence for the idea that there were origins as opposed to one origin of writing. A highly controversial issue as we went through in the last episode. So oral tradition on Easter Island itself, recorded in the 19th century, has it that the first settler, the legendary Hotomatoa, brought 67 tablets with him from his homeland in Polynesia, but we know of no writing systems in the rest of Oceania that predate the colonial period. If writing was invented on the island, we might accept expected to be found carved in stone on, for example, the Maui statues and on the walls of caves. There's no evidence for it, but there are petroglyphs with a distinct resemblance to Rongo Rongo signs. Though not as a rule on the Maui, yet it's perfectly possible that the petroglyphs existed before European contact, but no one on the island figured out how to use them to represent phonetic speech. So the first European visitors in 1722 saw no evidence of Rongo Rongo, but in 1770, when two Spanish ships called in and claimed the island for the King of Spain with a military ceremony, they compelled the islanders to sign a treaty. At least two of the signs used, the Volva and the Bird, resemble common petroglyphs, but they do not resemble Rongo Rongo. So perhaps say some scholars it was invented sometime after 1770 as a result of seeing the Spanish writing. Here are those signatures left on the Spanish treaty. And up here is the Mamari tablet written in reverse booster of aid and fly either reader reads line 1 from left to right and then turns the tablet through 180 degrees and reads line 2 in the same direction and so on. Interesting style. And here is a lunar calendar in the Mamari tablet. And it's not strictly speaking a calendar, but rather a list of instructions about where to insert two intergallery nights in the 9.52 day lunar month. Very complex. So modern attempts to decipher Ronga Ronga rely on a combination of internal analysis of the signs and the readings of Ronga Ronga collected from native informants in the 19th century before the tradition died out supplemented by knowledge of Polynesian languages. Scholars from many countries have uh, contributed, but progress has been slow, and there's much disagreement about the validity of the 19th century oral evidence, and about the number of signs in the writing system. Estimates of the latter vary from 55 or 60 basic signs to many hundreds of signs. One of the few generally accepted decipherments is that the Mamari tablet contains a kind of lunar calendar, a proposed decipherment of the Santiago staff by Stephen Rob, uh, Roger Fisher in the 1990s claimed to show that it recorded a creation enthusiasm by some and widely published. No other Ronga Ronga scholar accepts its validity. Unless more tablets are discovered, which is unlikely since wood rots quickly, we shall probably never know exactly what the Ronga Ronga boards originally said. Such a shame to lose the information and the evidence of culture's past. So that brings
brings us to the end of this penultimate part of the 70 Great Mysteries of Ancient Civilizations. Our final episode will focus on the fall of civilizations. Very interesting topic. I look forward to having you join me next time.